Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Paul Rice, and I'd like to welcome you to our event today on behalf of the Oral History Program of the Graduate School of Business. We're delighted to have a very distinguished panel with us here today. But before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to recognize a few people without whom this event would not be happening today. First, the director of the GSB Library, the home of the Oral History Program, Kathy Long. Um, I don't see her here right now. Um, a special thanks to Mie Augier, who's sitting in the back, a researcher here at the school who has been my collaborator in planning this event. And uh, I should note that she and Jim March just co-authored a new book from the Stanford University Press, The Roots, Rituals, and Rhetorics of Change, North American Business Schools After the Second World War, which is right up our alley. Finally, I wish to recognize Professor Jim March, who's been very generous with his time and advice and who has served as our sounding board and was kind enough to volunteer to be our monitor and moderator today. Today we hope to begin the exploration of the intellectual history of the GSB, and we intend this as a beginning. We plan to move on to the future to explore the history of the respective academic areas here at the school, such as marketing and accounting and finance and so on. Happily, because this is Stanford, the global history of these fields and the local history of our school are intertwined. You might notice that we have a limited audience today. There's a good reason for that, at least I hope there is. Jim and I discussed this and we decided to intentionally keep this gathering on a more intimate level. So there hasn't been a lot of publicity. Now this may seem odd given this venue, but we actually chose this auditorium primarily for its uh, filming capabilities. That being said, we're very happy to have all of you here today. The event's scheduled to last 90 minutes. It's being filmed, and we're going to load it up on YouTube. Toward the end, we'll have a short period for audience members to add any comments they wish, and we'll have a roving mic available for that purpose. So now to our panelists. Starting closest to me, Charles Holloway is the Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers Professor of Management Emeritus. James Howell is the Theodore J. Kreps Professor of Economics Emeritus. James March is the Jack Steele Parker Professor of International Management Emeritus. Robert Wilson is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management Emeritus. And Robert Jedeke is the Philip H. Knight Professor and Dean of the Graduate School of Business Emeritus. Dean Jedeke normally lives in Montana, so we're very happy to have him here with us today. So as I hand off to Jim March, please join me in giving the panel a warm welcome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I won't uh, do much because I'm dealing with my colleagues, and the one thing they know how to do is talk. But I do want to point out that this is a very select group. It is a group roughly my age. And the one thing I've learned about people my age is on the one hand, they've lived through periods that people younger cannot imagine having happened. On the other hand, their memories of those things are not, well, the memory that other people have of those things is not nearly as good as mine. So this is old folks' day, and you, we'll deal with them, deal with each other the way old folks do, with uh, grace, dignity, and beauty, right? The background for all of this is what happened at Stanford Business School starting sometime around 1956. As some of you know, earlier there was a history. The business school started in the 1920s. It uh, managed barely to survive <coughs> the Depression and the war. Uh, the Depression and the war under the deanship of J. Hugh Jackson who, whatever else one might want to say about him, managed to keep the school alive. By 1951, however, he had outlived his welcome. Well, actually, earlier than that, he had outlived his welcome. Uh, President Tresseter tried to fire him, but just about when he succeeded, Tresseter died. So Jackson continued. In 1951, Jackson wrote a letter to Wally Sterling, who was then the president, 
saying, essentially, I think I should summarize what you and the provost, who was Frederick Terman, think about the business school. As nearly as I can tell, he said, you think the school has raised no money, has faculty of inferior scholarship, has done no worthwhile research, and has no alumni important in the business community. Now, I, when me discovered this letter in the archives, I very much hoped that when you turned it over, you would see a note from uh, Wally Sterling saying, amen, or something, because Jackson was not foolish. He understood exactly what the attitudes of the uh, president and provost were. They wanted a totally different business school. And in 1956, I think it is, 1958, so in 1956, uh, Jackson finally resigned. In 1958, Ernie Arbuckle took over. And we are trying to reminisce a bit about what happened from 1958 until the end of time. And so the, uh, the first question for each of these gentlemen is how did you happen to stumble into Stanford? What was it like? Who got you here, and what do you think of it? Chuck? Well, I'm uh, pleased to answer that question. Thank you for the, for that, the nice uh, prelude. I have to say, uh, while I'm as old as these gentlemen, I wasn't here then. I was out building nuclear submarines. So my, my entry into Stanford happened in 1968, and um, it, uh, it was... Um, my thesis advisor, who knew Bob Wilson, who suggested that Bob interview me, which he did, and he and Chuck Benini uh, were kind enough to, uh, to make me an offer. I was a mathematical programmer, which as nearly as I can tell uh, was of no use to anyone, um, but it was uh, sophisticated modeling, and so part of the, the thrust of Stanford at that point in time was to try to get disciplines who will engage in the, uh, the various management fields. And so that was the thing that attracted me to Stanford. Jim Howell is sometimes viewed as one of the uh, main provocateurs of the change in business schools. Uh, you wanna say a little bit about why you ended up at Stanford, a nice, honest Berkeley, fellow, Berkeley Yale fellow? Well, I was working for the Ford Foundation in New York except I wasn't in New York. And uh, my job was to go out and visit universities. Aaron Gordon, my partner, and I separated them into groups, one for him, one for me. And I got 46 universities in the United States. And I had to go spend three or four days with each one, uh, visiting the business school, talking to the president, the provost, or whatever it might be. And Stanford was on my list. So I showed up here, and I wrote, and said I wanted to see the president. Uh, new, relatively new President Sterling. And the secretary wrote back and said, uh, he does not take job applications, so you should go to a school or a department. And I said, you haven't read my letter, have you? And try it again. And Sterling then said he would see me. So I walked in to his office. My job is to come to find out about what was wrong with the business school. And a pan about the size of a dinner plate came out, stuck out toward me, and then grasped my eye. So he's happy to talk. He said, give me 30 minutes. We spent four hours. And uh, we talked about the business. And I said, what's wrong with it? He said, what isn't wrong with it? Uh, and, he went, and he went on and told me about the Jackson event that you just mentioned. And said, you know, you have to have sympathy with them. He said, they, they'd just gone through the post-World uh, War II era, in which they were just a deluge of students around. They had no money, no endowment, uh, poor facilities and just staggering workloads. So he said that those few people who did research stopped doing it, and he said everything was essentially involved in processing this huge flow of World War II veterans. He said they're exhausted. They haven't done any research for years. And he said, I would like somehow or another to move them out in a polite fashion and start over again. He said they made it difficult because they've gotten together and decided who they want to be as dean. They chose one of themselves. So they said, the first thing I did was to have a meeting with them with the full professor and say, no, 
you're not going to choose the next dean. I'm going to choose the next dean. And I asked him something, and we talked for a while about that and about the school itself. And he said, I want you to know there are many departments at Stanford that are in more or less the same position as the business school. If there are only two or three or four really healthy departments. He said, the university has been having money troubles since the early 30s. It got worse at the end of the 30s because they put all of their assets in government bonds. And, that, and, and that had, inflation was not friendly to that uh, decision. Uh, and he said, uh, we have so many problems. With the, they just have to look somewhere and find a department that might be able to change and grow. And he said, it'll be, it'll be the business school's turn pretty soon. I said, what are you going to do to move it along? He says, I'm hiding a dean. I've already decided who the next dean should be. He said, I, I can't convince him. And of course, that was Ernie Arbuckle, who'd been on the board of trustees. So uh, Ernie said, absolutely not. Now, one of the things, uh, many of you know Ernie well, one of the things I really want, I, I realized about Ernie after working with him for a while is he didn't really like academics. He was polite about it. He didn't want to be an academic. He didn't believe in academics. He didn't believe in the intellectual life. He wanted to be an executive in business. He wanted to be in the corporate boardroom. Those are the people he liked, and that's what he wanted to be. But he was polite enough about it. And so it was partly money. This university wasn't going to pay him very much. Partly he didn't want a life as an academic. He couldn't imagine anything worse, uh, particularly as a dean. Uh, and so Wally said, take a, take a trip with me. So he took Ernie to New York and handed him over to Herbert Hoover, who worked him over uh, for a whole day. And at the end of it, Ernie says, I give up. I'll take the deanship. And what Hoover really did, in addition to beating on him, was to said, I'll take care of the money problem. I will introduce you to enough people and process things so you will be able to raise the money that you need and we'll pay you a reasonable salary that you would fit, in some sense, the executive life. And Ernie said, all right, what I want to do it for a short time. I want to get out of that place as soon as I can. I want to be an executive. I want to be in a corporate boardroom. And you could see it with him all the time, the 10 years that he was here. He really, he liked the place, he appreciated it, he admired the academics within limits, but he didn't want to be one of them. They were a different tribe, and they, most of them sensed that. But he was a great dean, and he did wonderful things. Bob Jedeke. Well, I... How did an honest person like you ever get caught up in this place? Uh, probably the same way a lot of others got caught up in the, I came here in the uh, very early 60s. And I, there must have been a remarkable set of accomplishments between what you hear about 56 and 57 and 58 and what it was like in, in 60. And uh, just a few years later, uh, it it was uh, it it seemed clear from even from a distance that interesting things were going to happen here, and um, I had the uh, great opportunity of uh, spending one of my years at Harvard in uh, uh, IBMAB, the Institute for Basic Mathematics for Application to Business. Arithmetic. That, and I, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of overlapping with Jim Howell in that, uh, in that program. And what, that was about six, 59, 60, something like that. So I, I learned a lot about Stanford from Jim. Ernie seemed to spend a fair amount of his time at the Harvard Business School, I think recruiting, talking to faculty. And, uh, but it, uh, it, it, it seemed from, a di from that distance, and I never ever came out here. I was offered a job and I accepted it without coming for a visit. And, and I think part of that was uh, everybody seemed to be so consistently um, the, the story from everybody was very consistent, that uh, it all hadn't happened, but lots of things were going to happen, and, and uh, the uh, school's headed in an improvement direction, and everybody seemed to be on board in that. It, it, uh, I, I didn't find anybody who sort of disagreed with that. 
And uh, I think there were a number of things that, uh, uh, I, one thing that I, I just never will forget, nobody ever asked me this question, talking to Arbuckle at one point, and he said something like, uh, well, uh, if you came to Stanford, what would you like to do? Now, keep in mind, I was a non-tenured associate professor. I was not talking to one of the, the stars that came here. But nobody ever asked me that question. It was usually like, we have a position for someone who would like to uh, teach the control course, 125 sessions a year, and a mixture of uh, disciplines, most of which I didn't know very much about. Or it, you know, it was like, you want, we'd like you to come here and fit into and do a job, but we'll define the job. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember what I said to him when he said, well, what would you like to do? I think I was so kind of flabbergasted that I didn't quite know how to handle that question. But uh, it, it sort of brought everything together. It was like, well, if, if you recruit good faculty and good students and uh, have young leadership and, you know, good things will happen. We don't know exactly what they were. I didn't know what they were. But, um, uh, but that, that was sort of the, I don't know, that was my mindset. And, uh, uh, and you know, it turned out to be a, uh, a great choice. And I, I remember I did ask Hal, I think, uh, well, when I, when I come, what other faculty members were hired that year? And it turned out to be who? Ezra, Ezra Solomon, uh, Al Hasdorf, um, Fred, I remember Fred Tong came from Carnegie, as I think he may have been a visitor. Gary Meyer, I think. Uh, Gail Oxley, Pete Pond as, a, as an associate dean. Uh, I don't know, I, it's dangerous to name names because you probably at this age forget some of them, but that was a pretty impressive pretty impressive group. I think uh, Ted Marks was coming back. I don't remember whether he had been here, but they had the international, I came International Center for Advancement of Management Education was already kind of an operating entity. They were doing some, uh, I think Sloan was founded sometime in the 50s, the senior executive program. And, and I think the other thing that was important at least to me, was that uh, uh, I, I may be the only one here that has an undergraduate degree in something called business administration. You didn't do that. Howell certainly didn't. You didn't, and Bob didn't. He did an MBA, but not, uh, but, but not an undergraduate. <coughs> and the undergraduate was uh, pretty descriptive. <laughs> they, there was no such where, thing. Where I, I, I don't know that he ever really mentioned the word. And I, I, it wasn't this particular school. I think that was the lay of the land in those days. You didn't really mention management. The, 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 the functions, if they wanted to teach you something about marketing, would describe what wholesalers were and drop shipping. And I don't know. All, it gave you vocabulary. But it, it re I don't think this is an overstatement. It was really almost a kind of an introduction to business course over the whole. Now, I, I don't, that's, that's the way it was. And uh, uh, to, uh, to sort of be a, uh, well, to, 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 uh, as opposed to, I think, graduate education, at least the focus seemed to be on how do you manage something or what, what do you need to know to be a good manager or things of that nature. It was a look at markets and organization. It wasn't as sophisticated as it is now by any means, but at least the focus was in the right place. And what? so there was. There was managerial accounting, managerial finance, managerial marketing, and at least I wanted to affiliate with managerial accounting. So. Everything, it seemed like all, kind of all the ducks were lined up right. One of the uh, mantra of that revolution of sorts 
was to increase the density of disciplinary trained faculty members in business schools. And the people you listed, several of them clearly that, you know were, that. were of none that of them, sort. None of them came from, no. oh, the other one was Alan Mann. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so none came from, uh, no. from, from business school. And Bob Wilson is, as many of you know, a kind of faculty uh, hero because he, he really has a serious academic reputation. How did, how did you stumble into this place? I stumbled in. That's <laughs> just what happened. I, uh, when, when I left Harvard, Stanford was invisible to me. I, was, I never saw any sign that they were recruiting from the PhD program at, at Harvard. So if, if Ernie was there recruiting, he didn't come <laughs> he, around to the He was PhD on the wrong program. side of the river. And um, uh, I went to UCLA. And I'd been there six months when I was in the office of Jerry Wiest. And uh, he was, turns out he was on the phone with Pete Winters. And he was turning down an offer to come visit for a year because he had just bought a house in the San Fernando Valley. And I shouted, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go. Give it to me. <laughs> so uh, I just got on the phone and said, yeah, I'm interested. So I came up, and it, I immediately became very interested because I guess Bob and Jim had invited Howard Rafa, who was my thesis advisor, <laughs> to come for a year. So this turned out to be a very exciting thing. I went into Bud Peterson, who was the associate dean at the time, was he? I went to Bud Peterson's office, and it was very simple. I'll give you $10,000, no travel expenses, no promises, one year, you're here, and then you're gone. So I came up, and uh, I really liked it immediately. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I, did I beg for a... An appointment, I think, Jim or Bob, if you guys what, didn't know. What year? I mean, huh? What year? This is uh, would have been uh, Early the fall 60s. of '64. Okay. Fall of '64, and um, I don't know. I do remember having this sense of, I hope they keep me on. So uh, why? Well, I don't know. I had what an immediate attractive? sense of liking it. There was this whole group that had come from Carnegie Mellon, and I was trying to go through the whole list, but you had Fred Tong and. There was Ferdinand Levy, Gert von der Linde, yeah. can't Fred remember Tom, them all. Peter huh? Winters. Peter Winters Chuck and so Benini. on. Chuck Benini. Chuck And then there, was, uh, there were characters like Harper Boyd in uh, marketing. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it was a lot of fun. And the campus, we were in this, uh, these temporary trailers mm -hmm. over at the far end of campus. Jordan Quad. Jordan Quad. And... Uh, I don't know, there really did seem to be a, uh, a kind of a magic quality. And I always thought Ernie was, uh, now, was some, a source some, of it. Somehow something grew out of that that really was a fairly important center for game theoretic types of theory development. How did uh -huh. that happen? Well, I had that interest, but, um, you know, in our audience here is like, Dave Kreps, who's actually the, well, the stimulus for me. And, um, you know, it came out of our, our uh, just work that sort of decision theory that went from individual decision theory into kind of multi-person decision theory. And as we got more involved in economics, then it was more game theory as a tool of analysis in economics. So, um, I might say another thing, well, there was this other aspect of keeping, was the doctoral program. Because I remember that Bob Jedeke and Harvey Wagner started the new doctoral program when I arrived in 64. And you guys, you sort of shoved everything aside and started with a clean slate and it was a healthy program and it looked really good, I thought. And I thought that, um, that that had a, um, had an impetus that just sort of grew, that the fact that the school got off with a really strong doctoral program 
where it was seen, where you guys took the point of view that the, f that the doctoral program was a complement to the faculty, which I really think it's turned out to be that uh, the stimulus for the faculty comes so much from the doctoral program. That was sort of a confirmation for me that Stanford meant what they said because here was a, a, a non-tenured associate professor uh, who they asked to, was Harvey Wagner, work on the doctoral program. And I thought, well, if, you know, if they really meant what they said about young leadership. You know, they, it, it, and, and that wasn't, there were lots of other things you could cite along those lines of uh, the youngsters running the show, you know. And, and, and they give you support for doing that. If I could add something, I remember a couple of times that Ernie Arbuckle came to around to my office, just stood in the doorway and said something like, how's it going? How can I help? Mm -hmm. yeah. Things like that. He, he didn't have any problems with the fact that he wasn't sure he understood what the winner's curse was? No, no, his view was, you know, I just, he, want, if I, he had the view that if he pats you on the back, uh, he's doing his job. Right, and that went. Jim would know. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like his job was to give this encouragement. You know, just help these young people along. Any young people? Well, I suppose he was selective. <laughs> <laughs> he helped some along in a different way. I think it's the case that R.J. Uh, went around uh, periodically to everyone. R.J. and uh, knocked on their door and. Your heart rate doubled, and there was the dean standing there. Uh, but it was a great motivator. Uh, maybe you should be in your office more often, I thought no. to myself. <laughs> Were there uh, work ethics? Well, it certainly were work ethics. I mean, I think I might have been the last person that Jim Howell hired, and he was reminding me of uh, the first summer, I went in and asked him for summer support, and he said, you have to finish your PhD thesis first, and uh, I don't think anyone will think the worst of you for doing it without summer support. So I went out and finished my thesis. So he was, he, he was stingy. Was he also demanding? He suggested I finish my thesis. Uh, and with, in no uncertain terms. The money was irrelevant. Finishing the thesis was important. And what happened at the end of the summer in September? Well, I discovered that actually you could get paid from the source of money that you brought from the Ford Foundation without having a PhD. And I went in and I relayed that to you, and you um, gave me a ninth, I think, which allowed me to buy a car. Thank you, Jim. So basically a patsy, right? Yeah. 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 Who are the important people? In Who those are the early, what? Important people in those early days or those middle aged days, whatever they were. We're talking about the early 60s or yeah. 50s? Or? The 60s, 50s, 60s, up to maybe 75. Well, you, 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 the problem is you start naming people, you're going to, you're, you're you can't name them all. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, there, there were, I don't know, sort of name, name the field and, and, or the discipline or the function or whatever, and, and you've got people who had something to, to contribute by way of uh, increasing the uh, or, or improving the quality of name it, uh, the, the quality of uh, teaching, the doctoral program, the uh, the, uh, uh, the the quality of the students that came, the, the 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 quality of the faculty that uh, uh, that that came because I think they sensed the same kinds of things that were going on that. We probably sensed when we came here, and 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 the um, uh, I have a lot. Of, I also have a lot of uh, you know sort of 
the remembrances of people that were here before even before all this began that you would have expected to offer some resistance uh, and uh, it, it, at least I didn't experience that, uh, that, that, that resistance. That is not to say everybody was always in agreement with uh, uh, who the higher should be in uh, uh, organizational behavior or, uh, you know, name it. But, uh, but it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the resistance necessarily. It was, let's make sure we try to do this as good as we could. No, that kind of thing. The old, yeah, old guard was swamped. Pardon me? The old guard was swamped. And From they were 52 tired. to 62, there was a, a well, tri I, tripling yeah, of I'm, the I'm, faculty. I'm talking about the 60s. I'm not talking about... Well, by that time, you'd cleaned out most of the old guard. Well, so, so what did you say, Jim? Did there were 14 full professors when I arrived. And four years later, there were one. There, there was only one left. They all retired. And so the, there was no... no there was no so it's a fixed, established group there. The, the turnover was so rapid. Yeah, I had a view that there were actually some very important figures. And I th actually, the, the two uh, the successive associate deans, I thought, besides Ernie's sort of warm, generous uh, everything, mm -hmm. but, you know, Jim Howell, if I can talk about Jim while he's here, but, I mean, he was... It wasn't just that he was, you know, effective, and then Bob Jedicke, uh as this very effective associate dean that, that had this wonderful confidence of the faculty. It's the, that they took the attitude that they would take care of the administration of the school. We're not going to be departmentalized. We're not going to have sort of faculty debates. The associate deans will take care of all this academic administration and the faculty should get on with their research work and teaching. And I, like, I can remember the day that Jim Howell came in to the faculty meeting as we were moving into the new building in 1966, was that it? And he said that uh, next year we're just going to have classes on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. You know, I mean, do you remember? And, <laughs> It's not that they put it up for a faculty vote or anything like that. It's like, I think this would be a better way to do it. And so I'm assuming we're going to do that unless I hear some rebellion kind of thing, right? No. There were these things that just got done, and there was no struggles. And I can remember with the one year I spent at UCLA, there were struggles of faculty. They are struggling with each other. And here it was no struggles. Somehow the associate deans are doing a great job of handling everything, and the faculty can just get on with being researchers and teachers. I think this was somehow your idea, wasn't it, Jim? That no, I was the front man for it. It was Ernie's idea. Basically. Ernie's idea. Yeah. Oh. He said, these people don't know to be involved, shouldn't be involved in running the school. That's the people at the top should run things. This is the executive in it. He didn't really believe in democracy. <laughs> and uh, so he, uh, so it he, really he, worked. I huh? talked it over with him, and he said, "Go announce it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lay down the edict." <laughs> I, I think people were agape. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> you know, this thing about uh, two sessions a week. Because when I came, we taught six days a week, Monday through Saturday morning, and three times a week, one-hour sessions each course, and we were all just. We were killing ourselves with just time in the classroom, and a lot of it was sort of dysfunctional because short sessions three times a week. I mean, that was, and you just sort of said, well, we're going to change it from that to this because it'll work better, and there was no struggle. Now, there, there's a new book out that says one of the major things that's happened in American higher education over the last 50 years is the the growth in faculty has been much outstripped by the growth in administration. Does that happen here? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Does it have, it obviously has positive consequences, things get done. Does it have any negative consequence? It's all budgetary consequence, but uh, in terms of getting things done, it really gets things done. Right? 
But uh, didn't you say that IT would eat you alive? Did what? I can remember when you were associate dean or when you were dean, there was this famous statement like, IT, you know, uh, computers, it'll eat you alive. It's a good thing, but it'll eat you alive. Because <laughs> 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 of the cost. Right? I can remember, Jim, when... Uh, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. I can remember uh, when uh, uh, I was in the associate dean's office um, when the other... Uh, Dean, uh, associate dean that worked with RJ, uh, Jim Van Horn, uh, had left, and every year he would look at the telephone directory, and he would count up the number of staff people and the number of faculty people, and he would do the ratio. And if that ever got out of whack, I mean going up at all, he would sit me down and he would explain to me how we were going to hell in a handbasket. And, and he understood at that point in time that we had limited resources. And, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so I paid attention to that. <laughs> well, well, I, know, I think it's a little difficult because Bob and I are the only virgins here, I think. As we're surrounded by... Ac uh, Bob Wilson. Associate Dean. Dean. So, yeah, right. Associate yeah. Dean, Bob Wilson. Yeah. Right. Never been an administrator. Well, I was a well, PhD well, program. When I came in here... Uh, 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 did Hornigan go home? No, he's here. There he is. Where is he there? He's there. He said, oh, it was George Parker makes a statement that I agree with, and that is that uh, uh, of all the people around here, the, the, one of the people who made the greatest contribution to the school over the years and managed not to have any administrative responsibilities at all was Chuck Hornigan. <laughs> yes, so right. you, can, you can ask him how he... Uh, made that happen, but uh, but there weren't there weren't very many who avoided the administration because we all relied on our good friends and colleagues. I I remember uh, Jim asks Jim Van Horn to be the director of the MBA program. I don't I think that that resided in the dean's office. Uh, because it seemed to be too important a program to have a non-dean director or something like that. So he did that, and then when I came in, I felt overwhelmed, and so I asked Jim if he, how about just being an associate dean and directing the MBA program and doing other things? But, but he, he, one of the things I think you have to keep in mind is that um, there were a lot of things that happened in the dean's office because the, 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 we thought it best, and when I say we, I think the faculty shared this, uh, to sort of not have hard-line departments where you ended up with silos. And so a lot of things that a, a department chairman may have done uh, got done in the, in the yeah. dean's office. That was a conscious choice. And the other thing that that, uh, that, that uh, put a lot of uh, time pressure on the, uh, the, the faculty in those days was fairly small. And uh, a, a, lot of, uh, uh, a, a lot of the emphasis in recruiting was at the non-tenure level. And uh, so, I don't remember who invented this, but let's have the fireside chats where we meet with faculty and uh, individual faculty and work out teaching assignments. I'm sure some version of that still goes on. But what it did was it, it, it uh, uh, a lot of things that would have been done at like a departmental level or whatever uh, got done at, uh, and so it was a demand, demanding job. And I'm sure that <laughs> David Kreps and all the others in this group who have served as associate deans felt that in one way or another. One of the things that startled me when I came here was that the associate deans were in fact respected. Was what? Were respected. <laughs> Absolutely, they were respected. Where I, most of my life have been, associate deans are mice studying to be rats. But here that wasn't true. As I think consistently while I've been here, the associate deans 
may have been bastards, yeah. but they were our kind of bastards. And, uh, well, our old colleague Bob Davis used to say you can always tell a dean from a faculty member because uh, any dean will move his lips when he reads. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it wasn't quite shared with everybody. Yeah, okay. You know, Jim, just going back to, your, to the role of associate deans and the importance that they played in shaping the school. Uh, so um, I told you one story that I... That I <clears throat> um, had with, with Jim Howe, but I, I would have to say that I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for Jim Van Horn, because Jim Van Horn uh, took it upon himself to manage my career. And he would tell me what I needed to do in no uncertain terms. And um, uh, I think that was, that was part of what associate deans did there and did then. And so I think that was part of what happened in that era, to bring in people who were not basically engaged in management or business and get them into the classroom and get them into doing research that could be used to build your career. And uh, at least for me, I didn't have many other colleagues who were giving me that kind of advice. So I think the associate deans took on that role in a very interesting way. Now, there were a bunch of other folks, and Chuck Horngren is one of them, Lee Bach is another one, right. uh, Bob Wilson is another one. These are people who never were associate deans, right. but were unquestionably respected and, and leaders. How did that work? <clears throat> Well, I would say that um, in terms of, of Lee Bach and Chuck Horngren, um, speaking as a young faculty member just coming in, I mean, you just paid attention to whatever they said. And they were wise men. And so... Well, but the young don't, in general, pay attention to what old folks say. Well, I think... I think that it was, part of this I think was because there were a lot of us around who didn't know anything about business. And yet we were in a business school and we were trying to learn about business and we were trying to, to part of what I think was happening is you were bringing uh, the, the, the disciplines to the functional areas. The course that you and, and, uh, and Bob took back at Harvard. Uh, but the other thing that was happening is, it's sort of the same thing, but the other way around, that is you were taking uh, disciplines and you were giving them management problems to work on that expanded their role and it, somebody had to help with that. I mean, a great example is Bob Wilson and, and Dave Kreps, where they took mathematics to economics in a way that it hadn't been there before. Another example would be uh, Mike Harrison, who took what was basically a dead uh, discipline, queuing theory. Queuing theory had been, uh, 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 Jackson at UCLA had done the last seminal work on queuing theory almost 20 years before. And when, when uh, Mike Harrison saw that it could be applied to production and manufacturing, all of a sudden, instead of trying to prove theorems about it, they developed a diffusion approximation, which gave you really good results. And he went down to Intel and helped them with their manufacturing. Now, those are just two examples of how bringing management problems to disciplines uh, had a huge effect, on, I believe, on this school. You can also look at the fact that when I got here, the OR, OR department was clearly uh, the very top of not only the OR department, but probably in terms of prestige, uh, could be argued at Stanford University. Some people left there and came to the business school, Dave Kreps, Mike Harrison, uh, two examples, and they continue to thrive. What happened in OR was they didn't get this other DNA in, other things to help them extend and broaden their discipline. 
And OR now is not a particularly uh, important um, field here at Stanford. I'd like to say a word about the disciplinary approach because I realized as you said that, that I'd forgotten that, that Stanford impressed me early on that it had a, that there, the point of view was that the, the disciplines of the social sciences and mathematics and so on were represented in the fields of the school. When I'd been at the Harvard Business School, there was, you know, there was control and marketing and production and so on. They were functional areas, but the disciplines were either invisible or anemic or unrepresented or whatever, and it was a, an appalling situation. The ignorance, you see, I left Harvard with some bitterness at the, what I thought was just appalling ignorance of the literature of their own fields. And it's because the disciplinary fields were not represented, that economics was not well represented, that, say, sociology and organizational behavior, social psychology and so on, was not well represented. <coughs> there were some people, like in, say, in economics, there was John Lintner, who some of you know is very well known at that time. But these people sort of functioned in isolation. There was not a institutional support for disciplinary research within, this, within the school. And you guys here at Stanford had already, I guess, Jim Howell, it must have been that the Gordon of Howell report is the source of that here, is that? No. How did it happen that we, that Stanford, somehow when I got here, you already had this vision that there would be disciplinary uh, fields? I think it was a function part of our size. It was a very small school when, when I arrived, when Ernie, Ernie and I arrived at the same time. Uh, and we would talk about it, and he said, well, you can't have departments the way you do in the School of Engineering or something of the sort, or the School of Medicine. And I said, you don't want them anyway. He was seeing it as, it's not a possibility given our size, and I said, uh, evil things lurk in departments, and yeah. you better watch out for that. And so we talked about it over and over again, and as we began to hire people, and remember, the old guard just disappeared almost completely in, in a year and a half, and so we began to hire people, we made certain that we didn't essentially create a departmental structure, again, as engineering had here at Stanford and other places. It didn't fit us, so we tried something else. So it was a deliberate intent. He felt comfortable with that, with a business background. Uh, he, and he also wanted to keep touch with people. And he didn't want a structure that would prevent that. So it was a deliberate discussion co coming out of our circumstances. But the, the disciplinary focus clearly was in the Gordon Howell report. It clearly was in the Ford Foundation initiatives. And it clearly was at Carnegie Mellon, which was clearly the model for Ernie Arbuckle. Yeah, Lee, Brock, Lee Bach must have reinforced that in, because he always had the Ernie's ear, didn't he? I mean, he was... Oh, well, he had RJ's ear. <laughs> RJ's ear. He was, <laughs> he was always so influential, and I think he had a... He was an economist himself, and I think he thought in terms of the social sciences as being the sort of underlying mm -hmm. yeah. uh, disciplinary... Um, basis for management no. studies. Well, the school he built at Carnegie Tech had virtually no faculty with any experience in a business school. Yeah, but you had other, but you may have had other people that didn't. I, I always thought the, the school sort of got validated, that, that approach got sort of validated when you had both people coming in, faculty people coming into the disciplines are coming into the school with, from the disciplinary yeah. base. You had um, uh, d d d R.J. is a first-class businessman who found it interesting enough uh, that th we had these kinds of faculty. And, no, he was and, a whiz and, kid, Well, remember. and everybody stayed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they yeah. found that uh, the, 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 oh. the economists, the behavioralists, the... Uh, uh, the um, political economist found those problems interesting enough and challenging enough that they were willing to bring their discipline or whatever no. to bear on on those problems. R.J. comes here, and and, uh, and I, I can remember lots of times faculty members talking to him about the, the, they knew their discipline. 
but he knew an awful lot about the problems that were out there for management, you know, and, and you get these kinds of interactions yep. going, and people stay in those, in, in that kind of school. As and they, I, were, and it, they were engaged Yeah, well, we've been at this now for long yeah, enough that yeah. it, it's still happening, that it's a certain kind of validation that the, that the model, and that doesn't say it's perfect or it can't be improved on, but that the direction seems right. Now, we've had, we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, patting ourselves on the back. Were there any problems? Oh, sure. sure. Were there any weaknesses? Ask R.J. about the financial problems of the, the, the <laughs> cliff when the Ford Foundation support just suddenly terminated. And, and uh, that, that removed a lot of budgetary support, which he had to lean on some of his friends to help. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to help deal with, but yes, there were those kinds of problems, certainly, and you know. The, uh, the, I, I, the operating expense budget from 52 to 62 went up well, six times. And I suppose it did after that too, but. There's a word I wanted to say about the, um, I don't know, it's connected to this, but I wasn't a member of the FAB, the Faculty Advisory Board that uh, recommends appointments and promotions to the dean. I wasn't a member of that till like 70 or 71, uh, so it was later. But one of my experiences in those early years was just an amazement at the quality of the reviews that were conducted and the standards. And uh, so, I mean, when I arrived there, I was just stunned at how wonderful a deliberative body it was and how seriously people took the review process. And I think there's something there that happened early on where the associate deans had specified the form in which reviews would take. That there would be this, the ad hoc committee, that the ad hoc committee would solicit letters from inside and outside and that there were these, this statement about the, the standards for promotions in terms of uh, excellence in teaching or research and so on that, um, and one of the things about it is I can, there were only a f you, you mentioned about negative things, but there were only a few FAB meetings in uh, 35 or 40 years I was on the FAB that I, of the meetings I went to, where there was acrimony or struggle, you know, that there would be serious debates, but the quality of those meetings, it seems to me, is something that outsiders can't see, but all of us have experienced, and I think many of the people here in the room have experienced, that the quality of the FAB meetings was somehow the a absolutely preeminent aspect of it all. I agree with that, As I, and particularly the tenure review. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely critical. That, I sat in, I, also Department of Sociology, Department of Political Science, and the review process in the business school was incomparably better than either of those. Right? In some small part, I think that was due to the lack of departmentalization. Yes, the depart lack of departmentalization was so productive of good things like that. I was sort Other of sorry to see when we moved to the new building here uh, that the uh, it was, uh, departmentalization was going to be allowed or even encouraged to grow again. No. The location. <clears throat> in terms the, of location. Yeah. The review process made mistakes. And, you know, like all review processes, it made many more mistakes of promoting people who shouldn't have been than of not promoting people who should have been. But it was good. It was a good process. Any other weaknesses? Um, well, you, 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 when you have a good experience, and as you said, this is an old folks gathering, you, you tend to remember all of the happy times and successes <laughs> and, and not the problems and the things you did wrong. And, you know, and, and, it, it's an ongoing process. I, I, I gotta say, as I, 
as a sort of a, a, a distance outsider now, when I read about the stuff that goes on down here, it struck me when I was reading about the curriculum revision a couple of years ago that that addresses, I, I think, it addresses in a very significant way uh, a, a problem that, uh, that kind of, I'm sure lots of us felt that the one size fits all sort of approach to the core and MBA education was not exactly the way, the best way to do it. But uh, we didn't make any serious inroads, I don't think, on that until you guys did it two, three, four years ago, or when I, you're in about the third or fourth year of the. So it's an ongoing process. And I think there were certainly, uh, I don't think we had the model for public management right the first time we did it. But uh, it, it got worked on and it, uh, it got changed. I think it started out as sort of urban management. And I guess that's because we wanted to narrow the focus. And then we found that wasn't exactly the best way to do it. So there are lots of examples of things that have changed for the better. But it took a while. It probably took longer than we'd hoped it would when we started. Well, I think the, the uh, urban management, public management program is a good example of the fact that we were willing to experiment. Uh, when yeah. RJ asked uh, Gene Webb to take over the, the urban management program, and Gene uh, invited me to be a co-director with him, I didn't know what I was getting into, but it seemed like if the dean asked you to do it, you ought to do it. Um, and we, so we, we tried some things, and, and Harry Rowan is sitting here today is one of the great results of that, bringing, bringing him in. And then I can remember trying to recruit Jim Patel to come down to be an associate dean. And, and uh, he correctly was reluctant to do it, but I was uh, pushing him pretty hard. And he said, OK, but I have one demand. And that is, uh, when I get down there, we're going to shut down the public management program. It just isn't uh, cutting it. So I said, Jim, here's the deal. Uh, we'll talk about it. But we're not going to talk about it until you've had three meetings with all the faculty in the public management program. After the first meeting, Patel had already figured out how to make it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, he then took that and turned it around and um, turned it into what it is today. Did we ever lose any faculty that we didn't want to lose? Oh, yes. Oh. I think it was a tragedy how many really good people we've lost over the years by being somehow we're out here on the West Coast and they're attracted back to the East Coast or that kind of thing. And we've had some, I mean, just heartbreaking <laughs> losses that way. Actually, I was thinking about it as I walked on the stage. You know, Ben Bernanke was uh, used to on our faculty and we lost him. And you could go back through a long list of really uh, people with outstanding careers that were here at one, one stage. And uh, I think it's, it is sad to realize how many of the, uh, how many of the best went through our hands. Uh, we, well, it was hard to hold on to them. If you have a good faculty, you'll lose them. That's, that's part well, that of the rule. For, yeah, right. But yeah. are there properties yeah. about the business school that make me more likely to lose some good faculty than Keep them. Yes, because the school's strength, again, this, I attribute this to the associate deans, but it was to uh, develop. The, the point of view is we are here to help younger people develop. We're going to encourage their careers. We're going to do what we can. We're going to help them grow. We're going to do, um, everyone has a tenure slot waiting for them if, you know, if he's productive. And so that has this tendency that you have these people who, whose careers develop, and then they get this nice offer somewhere else. This, is, this is, makes us vulnerable that way. Well, as I say, if you, if you really are good, have a good faculty, they're going to have good offers, right? So you're going to lose some. But you want to be careful that there aren't properties of your 
organization that make them a little more likely to smile on those? You you mentioned location. That's not something you can do a hell of a lot about. But are there any other things? You know, I got a fair amount of discussion over the years, I think, in, from time to time. Worry about is there something here that makes it less likely that the really good people who come here in discipl both disciplines and functions at non-tenure level just n never quite are able to progress as far as, then, then they go someplace else and do very well. I've I'm, heard. I'm not sure I, but that, that got a fair amount of attention, I think. Some of my friends say that the biggest disadvantage we have is the MBA culture and the MBA program. Is that is there any truth in that? That's not new. Yeah. Well, disadvantage in what? That's our mission, but uh, but it certainly impacted um, the some of the faculty who we didn't get because of that and who left because of it. One of the things it was a period of time where one of the ways we were able to get the Bernankes and other uh, people. Um, who were this, the outstanding graduates in their economics group to come to the Stanford Business School was because uh, of the money that had been raised by Ernie and RJ and others, um, lately Bob Joss, and uh, we could pay more. I'll never forget the time when I was at the provost office uh, and uh, Ken Arrow was there and we were in a meeting and he was complaining about the salaries that we were paying the economists coming out of MIT and Harvard. Because there was a period of time when the, if you were, a, if you were a, a top graduate in an economics department, the number one place to go was Stanford Business School. And it wasn't just for money, it was because of the people like Bob and others who were here. But Ken Arrow was complaining about this. And when we left, I said to him, Ken, what don't you know about economics? <laughs> What's going to happen is your salary's going to go up. You ought to be cheering me on. But there was a period of time there where we had an advantage. But there is also some, labor economics is a little more complicated than this, but well, the, the, simple, the simple vision says if you see a wage differential between two people doing the same job in two different locations, there's, a there's something wrong with the higher paying location. There's a reason, location. there's a reason, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Well, on that happy mm -hmm. note. Well, well, there's a lot of experience sitting out there in the audience. It, yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear if we can hear them. So RJ, how did you ever get, well, I don't, I, not, I shouldn't ask you, but. Uh, Lee Bach came out here and was a fairly important person. Uh, I can tell a story about Lee Bach that you probably haven't heard, that when I was being courted by Stanford, I was not coming to the business school. I got a call from Lee. Lee said, I've just seen the list of the people that were at the dinner trying to recruit you and I can do a lot better. And he was absolutely right. I had this deadly dinner with a bunch of people whom I won't mention names, but they were not the kind that would encourage you that this was a lively intellectual place. Lee organized a dinner with a quite different set of people, and uh, that's why I came to Stanford. And that was Lee. He was always looking for ways of uh, improving the system. Well, let's see. Chuck, you are one of the ones who uh, were part of the Carnegie Tech invasion of Stanford. What was it like when you came? <laughs> it was very different at Carnegie Tech. It was much bigger, obviously, uh, and big classes and so on. 
Uh, but there was, a, there was an element of, of, of newness and challenge and so on that, that, that was there. Uh, and uh, uh, so it was exciting to, to me to, to come here and, and, and do that. On a, on a different note, let me second what you're saying about the importance of Lee Bach. I, I thought that in terms of the developing the faculty, selecting the faculty, and so on, he had enormous influence and very good enormous influence. That was my, my own reading on that. I think we ought to hear from Marge A as to why he would come to Stanford from... Yeah. R.J.? What what do you see in us? That... Well, I'd like to second the comments that Jim and Chuck said about Lee Bach. I came here because of uh, Lee Bach. I was first really heard about him when I was on the Brookings Board of Trustees and Bob Calkins decided we were going to publish a book on inflation. He said, we'll get it done only if I get Lee Bach to do it because he's the most competent and only competent person to do the field. Well, that sort of perked up. I went on the, the, uh, the other thing that influenced me about Lee was that we kept, we had 1,200 MBAs at uh, Ford Motor Company, and I kept track, and the, the ones that did best in the company were the graduates of uh, Carnegie Mellon. So I went on the visiting committee, and when Lee called up, uh, said he was, he was really the head of the search committee. I think on paper, uh, Sterling was, but Lee Bach was the guy that ran the show as he usually got into these things. He said, uh, come on back, and I could make the story too long, but one question, the key question was, I said, if I come, Lee, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to stay. I said, Lee, with your advice, anybody could be <laughs> dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. You said that he, he, he really was the reason I came, and the reason a lot of success that we had here was because of his uh, real leadership uh, across the board. I want to say, too, Ad, well, I've got the mic here. I think the reputation of the school depends in large part on the <laughs> quality of the leaders. Now, I don't put myself in that group, but this group here and, and the others, I think, do lead it. I figured when I was here, the job of the dean was to provide an environment so that the good minds could do that good work. As Bob said, <laughs> when, when uh, Lee came to me, I said, well, Lee, what do you want, a fundraiser? Oh, no, no, RJ, no, no, we want you to be our leader. We, the he didn't tell me about this fun Ford Motor Company falling out of bed, <laughs> but when I got here, I found out, hell, people like Jenneke and Horngren and could run the school, I had to go out and, and shake the cup, and I think it worked out <laughs> so that uh, they, they, did, they did the job. I'm going to make a comment about uh, <coughs> Jim March, because he asked all the questions, but he did tell something about his own. When I was here one day, he s came over and said <laughs> that uh, he would, would like to move from the School of Education where he was over to the business school. Well, I was very gleeful. And about that same time, my wife and I were invited to come to the Soviet Union, and all I had to do was <laughs> make a few lectures. And I said, well, that's easy. I'll go to the library and look, <laughs> look up all the literature that Jim March has written and crib that and go over and make my lectures. Well, when I got there, I found out that his material had already been translated into Russian, <laughs> so <laughs> I couldn't go down that route. But my, uh, my uh, fears were eliminated when the Russian host told me that the, what they re really wanted me to talk about was how at Ford they could get ideas from the engineering lab into the factory floor and turn out a quality product on time. Well, I didn't have to go to the library <laughs> to find the answer to that. And before I sit down, I want to say how happy I am to see Bob Jedicke here today. <laughs> he, he did a fantastic job, and a lot of, the, very large amount of the credit, success of the school while he was here was a tribute to you, Bob. Thanks for being here. Well, I don't know you want to call on all the old timers. I'm not, I'm not sure that Dave Kreps is really an old timer. I mean, he looks like a, a patriarch, but Dave, you got any observations? Well, I have a question. Is this working? I have a question, um, and it's going to take a little bit of an introduction. Some years ago, five, ten years ago, a paper was written about papers in economics that had gathered more than, I think it was 500 citations that were published since 1970. 
And I looked through this list and I marked off the papers that had some connection to the Stanford Business School, either a faculty member at the school or somebody who had been a faculty member, somebody who was a PhD student. And it was over 20% of the papers. And the question is why? Why have people who've been touched by the business school had so much influence? And I think it comes down to balanced excellence. The idea that we aspire not only to be you know, a research institute of high quality, but also that you know, classroom stuff is important. Everybody works in the MBA classroom, and that grounds your research. It means that you can't go off and just fit angels on the head of the pin. When I came here in 75, balanced excellence was a big thing. And my question is, where did it come from? Who decided that we were gonna be a great teaching institution and at the same time try to be a great research institution? I don't, I don't know, maybe me knows. Do you know where the term balanced excellence came? No. Uh, I think it, in some sense, that term, I don't mean the whole thing, came out of the efforts of the school when it, after Ernie became dean to carve out a special place for itself between Harvard and, let's say, Chicago. Uh, and so it wanted to, the, and it, it was a sense of rhetorical trick. It says, we have all the beauties of Harvard with all the beauties of Chicago, all the rigor of Chicago with all the teaching efforts of, of Harvard. We are, we are balanced. Well, balance is what every dean every time always talks about. It's, it's a, so, but I think you're saying it actually happened here rather than just talk. Certainly there was discussion along those general lines in the Arbuckle administration, but I think RJ, my friend of my left here, uh, actually articulated it and made it a prominent part of his pitch to alumni and anyone else that would listen to him. So it, uh, it seems to me it crystallized in uh, the Miller no. Jetta Key. Uh, One can see it as a kind of rhetorical gambit though. You know, f faced with the competition, you say, we have all the good things of one of our leading competitors and the, all the good things of another of our leading competitors. We're the only place where you can get both Harvard and Chicago in one hall. And the question is, you know, is that just re rhetoric or is there something real in it? Oh, th this reminds me, well, I, during the, uh, we'd have these faculty meetings and, and I call them bitch sessions where we'd go out in the, in the woods somewhere and, and uh, you know, let get all the complaints coming in about the uh, parking and the courses and everything that Stanford, that all academics are able to do. But uh, each year I had invited Dick Lyman to come to these meetings and he never showed up. But this time he said he was coming. And so the bitching went up till about 40 minutes. I thought Dick Lyman's going to get here. It's 1975, and I said, look, time out. <laughs> it's okay to go on this, but let's just look at some facts here. We've just been voted number one <laughs> in the, by all the deans voting in the business schools. And of the five fields that we had, we were number one in all but two. And I said, so let's move into that mode as long as Dick is here, and as soon as he leaves, we can go back to pitching. <laughs> <laughs> and of the five fields, is Dave Montgomery here? No. No. Dave, one of them was marketing. And I said, Dave, you gotta get, gotta get this field up to, up to number one. And he came back later and said, RJ, at that particular time, we were gonna hire two uh, assistant professors in marketing, opening for, for, uh, for one go to hire one, and there were two outstanding ones coming off the pipeline. That's one big difference between academic and business. Academic people know who all the good people are around the country. In business, you hide your good people. In, in, in academic life, they publish and go to water spaces so they know who they are. And Dave said his counterpart at Harvard also was hired an assistant professor in marketing. And he said his Harvard professor says, Dave, you pick first because both of them prefer to come to Stanford over Harvard and we don't want to be turned down. <laughs> and that's how CNU got here? That's how CNU got here. Carnegie. <laughs> yeah. Another 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 Carnegie. 
Yeah, Carnegie had a tremendous influence, of course, on me. But I want to sort of go back to some things that you were telling. For a young assistant professor, or associate professor for me in that, in that case, this was really the ideal place because following things. You didn't have to serve on any committees. This is actually amazing. You might think it is uh, usual here, but you, you know, I was at Rochester for three years, and it is quite common for you to be on like three committees, for example. This takes up enormous amount of time. That's one. Number two, you had summer support you didn't have to worry about. And you wrote like a three-page report at the end of the uh, fall, sometime there, saying what did you do last year and what do you plan to do next year. I noticed in my case, whatever I said I'm going to do next year, I never did actually. I did something else. <laughs> but nobody seemed to worry about it because they just looked at, you know, you were productive. You know, it doesn't matter what you said at this time. So it was just a great place for a professor, assistant professor, associate professor to work. And I think the senior faculty, and I did my part in this, when you take in a young faculty, you kind of uh, mentored them. For example, you didn't give them too many courses to teach. For example, try to have them teach just one or two, so they are going to get better at it, number one. Number two, they are going to be much better in terms of the research output, which is what they should be really focusing on in those first seven years, et cetera. So I thought the, the way this whole place was set up, and the other thing about administration here, you didn't have to worry about anything. It just, the pay, the, whatever had to be distributed was on time, was exactly always right, it was always distributed. So the place was run very professionally. This, so the professor didn't have to worry about the nitty gritty details really, for example. So I think it was an environment in which young people could excel. And you know, once you had this thing going, together with the weather, there's no reason why I would leave this place. But did that better, change over time? Not for me. Uh, it did not change. But what you might find surprising is Stanford was not that well known in the 1970s, early 70s, for example. So for example, I didn't really consider coming here in any important way. And Dave Montgomery was recruiting me for a couple of months. And I didn't really actively even turn in my resume to him. And then when I came here and then saw the people as well as the place, it was, it was an easy one. No, I, I think it's hard for people to realize the change, not just in the business school, <clears throat> but in Stanford in general. The, uh, we, we first came out to California in 1955-56 for a year at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. One year was enough for Jane. She said, this is where we want to live. Go find a job. <laughs> and I said, well, Stanford just isn't good enough. You, or I would not consider it. So she said, OK, we'll go back to Pittsburgh, but we're going to live here. <laughs> and it took her 10 years, but she made it. Well, you know, the other thing you got to recognize is that uh, I think is that one of the important things, and it was important from, you know, in the, what happened in the 50s and the 60s as well as what's happening now is that uh, there's a tremendous advantage to us folks in the business school of being located in a very first class university. And, uh, and then the other thing is there are a lot more joint programs and joint research areas and all that. The, the business school is a much more, at least you get the impression from reading about it, that it's, it's a much more university citizen than it, it probably was in the Yes, I think the, the business school or, had a reputation yeah. of being a yeah, uh, yeah, living well, in a silo. But you guys, uh, but so that, I, that's an immense advantage. It must have been that Ernie and Jim made a key decision to locate the new building that we, we occupied in 66 right here close to campus. Because as I recall, we were offered this site clear out on Arrestadero. I mean, imagine <laughs> what, yeah. how different the business school would have been yeah. if we were clear out on Arrastadero, you know, I don't know, four miles from the central campus. 
they thought it would be like Harvard, being across the river or something like that. And it was, I think, a very key decision to say, no, we're going to take this property that's right in close to the quad. Yeah. All we had to do was come across the street. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Now, it, the, these feelings are on both sides of the world, of course. And one of my colleagues in, an, in another department, which I won't name, said how happy he was to see the business school in its new palace because it's out on the edge of the campus yeah. where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great facility. Yeah. George, do you have anything wise to say? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm sure it's not wise, but I, I, I do think that everybody here has been celebrating the notion of the people and the confluence of people who have come, many represented in this room, many who are not here today, uh, and, and there's no denying that. And then we've also commented on the, the good fortune the serendipity of being associated with a university that was on the rise. Stanford also was blessed by being in a state that has, has transformed itself and transformed the nation in many ways in the last three, genera or three decades. I think the population of California has gone from something like whatever it was, 1960, 15 million people to almost 40 million people on the Pacific Rim and then to be here in the heart of Silicon Valley uh, is, is just a, a, a combination of elements that you could hardly dream if you had to do it from scratch. Now, it's also true, however, that's not to deny the credit of, of everybody involved because there are other institutions in this state that have not similarly thrived. And Stanford has thrived in its own special way. Uh, but I do think we all have to uh, reflect on what good fortune it has been to be where we are when we've been here. Absolutely. I would also say that when I came for the first time in 1960, I heard your description, Jim, as an MBA student, and then I came back <laughs> 1965 as a doctoral student, entering with Bob Joss, I remember that fall, and then came back on the faculty in 1973 I've often said to people, those were three different places with the same name. Right. And the change was absolutely palpable. Yeah. And it goes on. I, I think you are very wise to remind us that if you write a history of the Stanford Business School as though it existed in a separate place and all the factors were included in the school, it's a wrong history. A lot, of the, a lot of that history was determined by forces outside the school. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have a failure I could mention. You what? A failure. Failure, yeah. OK. Because you look now, I don't know, some 30 or 40% maybe of the faculty or the senior faculty are women of great accomplishment. And you know, back in those early years, we had that opportunity to introduce women into the faculty, and we were blind to it. And I think that that was just a huge, just a vacuum where we didn't understand, somehow didn't appreciate that this wonderful opportunity to attract very able people was being missed. It was, there was this whole blindness that went on during it was, those, those very years. very slow. And now you see, you know, the, the role of women in the faculty is just, they're extremely prominent, very successful, and I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, there were some times when there was, when this school virtually failed the first women who came mm -hmm. here. I mean, Dave would remember, I mean, the, back in the early 80s, I guess that's not going that far back, but, you know, I th you know, Margaret Bray and, and I don't know how many others experienced various kinds of harassments and, uh, but that was the case, by the way, in which the associate deans, I don't know which ones they were at the time, but you guys really responded aggressively. It's like, we're going to stamp that out. Were you, you were associate yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think yeah, but. Uh, it did get stamped out. But it was, there was this uh, hiatus of the 60s and the 70s when women were 
were, were available, there was, they were getting trained, they were capable, and yet we were blind to the opportunity. Well, I, one of the things we didn't cover, of course, was the impact of the women's movement and the student protests of the 60s on the school. And, uh, but I think that we better save for the next time. <laughs> Paul? I'm prepared to declare that we have exhausted our memories, our patience, and no doubt our audience. So you're supposed to summarize everything that is said and explain what goes happens next. Well, that'll have to happen next time too, I think. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Jim and our panel very much for coming. and. Realize your time is valuable. This was extremely interesting, very rewarding. Um, and I wanted to thank the audience too for coming and for your contributions, which have been very enlightening as well. I mean, I, I realized as this panel was going on, there were so many people that are not on the panel who, uh, if we had all the people that we probably should be having talking about this, the whole stage would be filled. So it was great to get this kind of dialogue going here in the audience. So thank you everyone very much. Um, and. Uh, Thanks to our panel again. Come again.